have a, a very uh, you know honorable guest today, uh, Professor Sergey Levin um, from UC Berkeley, and he's going to talk about the generalization and the role of data in reinforcement learning. And I uh, briefly look at the uh, slide, and it's quite quite interesting. Um, he uh, uh, let me just briefly introduce uh, his uh, like uh, um, biography. Um, he received his BS and MS in computer science from Stanford, uh, 2009, and PhD in 2014. And he joined uh, UC Berkeley in 2016, and his work mostly focused on machine learning and decision making. And um, um, uh, lately, uh, you know, uh, personally, I have seen, uh, I've read a lot of his work, especially on his joint work with his, I guess your student, right? Uh, Chelsea Finn's MAML and that kind of work. And uh, he published numerous uh, like papers in, especially in the uh, enforcement learning, deep enforcement learning algorithms and more. So uh, without much ado, let me uh, welcome uh, Professor Sergei Levy. Thank you, uh, Professor Lee, for the introduction. And thank you all of you for attending. Uh, today, I'm going to discuss reinforcement learning algorithms from the perspective of how they can utilize data. Um, but uh, let's start with some higher level motivation. And by the way, for all of you that are listening, please, by all means, feel free to ask questions. You can ask questions in the chat if you like. I have plenty of time built in to respond to questions. Um, I'll start with some higher level motivation. Uh, this is a, you know, a fairly big question. What makes modern machine learning work? And I'll give maybe an overly simplistic answer to motivate where I'm going with this. At a very high level, what makes modern machine learning work so well is the ability to utilize very large data sets combined with the ability to train very large models. Now, of course, there is a lot more to it than that. Uh, there's all the research that we do, but these two ingredients have been at the core of many of the most effective machine learning systems that we use day to day. Systems for labeling images and photographs, translating text, recognizing speech, and so forth. However, the kind of machine learning systems that we really want to use in the real world are systems that can make decisions, systems that can choose what to do uh, to bring about desired outcomes. Uh, the kind of large data deep learning applications that are typically in use today are supervised learning applications that utilize independently distributed data. They have ground truth supervision, and the objective of these systems is to effectively predict the right label. Uh, in contrast, a lot of settings where we'd like to use machine learning systems, but where they're not used as actively, are decision-making domains. Domains where the system has to decide what to do to bring about an outcome. Things like driving a car or controlling a robot, but also managing a warehouse inventory, deciding how to trade uh, stocks for finance, deciding which treatments to prescribe to a patient uh, to uh, address their illness. These decision-making problems are characterized by different properties. Each decision can change future inputs. So the inputs are not independent. Supervision may be very high level. It may just be a goal like cure the patient or make the largest profit. The objective is to accomplish the task and there isn't necessarily ground truth supervision for which actions to take to accomplish that task. And I would emphasize these are not just issues in, in kind of what we classically think of as control problems. In many cases, real world deployment of ML systems that we think of as supervised systems actually has similar kind of decision-making properties. For example, uh, if you have an app that uh, predicts traffic and makes recommendations on routes for uh, people, you might think that it's a prediction problem. It's a supervised problem. Predict whether there will be a traffic jam, but it will affect what people do and in turn, that will change whether your predictions are right or wrong. So when you deploy ML systems, when they make decisions, even if, they, even if you train them as supervised systems, those decisions will have ramifications and it's really a decision-making problem in disguise. 
So for this reason, it's very important for us to be able to build systems that make effective decisions and reason about consequences. Now, um, if you know something about my work, you might be expecting at this point that I would tell you that reinforcement learning holds the answer to this. But the story is a little more complex than that. So reinforcement learning is the branch of machine learning that deals with decision making. But in its classic formulation, reinforcement learning is a very active learning setting. You have an agent that interacts with the world, collects some experience, uses that to improve its model or policy, and then collect, throws out that data and collects more experience. And this is done many times. Now, reinforcement learning has been very successful in uh, a number of domains, playing video games, basic robotic skills, uh, playing the game of Go uh, very effectively, actually beating the world champion. Uh, these are very impressive applications, but if we look at them, they look very different from the kind of applications where supervised learning methods have been successful. What's the difference? What's the difference between the left side and the right side? Well, the RL tasks, they're very complex in that they require a complex strategy to solve, but they're also very narrow. They are closed world environments. Machine learning systems for image recognition, speech recognition, and so on are useful because they handle open world variability. The speech recognition system can recognize anyone's speech. The image recognition system can recognize any image. But the reinforcement learning systems exist in narrow worlds with well-known rules. AlphaGo can play Go very well, but it doesn't know what to do if someone spills coffee on the Go board. It doesn't deal with things that are outside of the rules that govern that closed world. So there's an enormous gulf, and it's not a gulf of strategic complexity, it's a gulf of generality, of breadth and diversity. Why can't we just train reinforcement learning systems on huge data sets like we do for image recognition? Well, because if we have an active learning setup, if every time we collect data and improve our model, we have to throw out that data and collect more data. And if we need image net size data sets to generalize, that means that we're generating it, data sets the size of ImageNet every time we improve our model, which in the real world is not at all scalable. So can we develop data-driven methods, methods that can utilize large static data sets the same way that you can train a big supervised learning system on a huge data set like ImageNet? Can you train an RL system on a large pre-collected data set? Classic on-policy RL doesn't do this because classic on-policy RL requires new data to be collected each time you modify your policy. Off-policy reinforcement learning goes a little bit beyond this. In off-policy reinforcement learning, we interact with the world, append the data to a, a data buffer, use that whole buffer to update our policy, and then interact with the world some more. But as I will describe shortly, that additional interaction is still very important for such algorithms to work well. What we would like is offline reinforcement learning algorithms. Algorithms that can take a data set that was previously collected by some policy, and we don't even know what that policy was, take that data set and extract the best policy we can get out of it, and then deploy that policy. Um, to illustrate this, I, this concept with an example in a robotics setting, imagine that you want a very powerful, highly generalizable robot Maybe it has a big data set from all of its past interactions, all of the things it has done before, uh, cooking, cleaning, manufacturing. You will take all of that data, use it to train up the best policy you can for the new task that you want to solve. And then if you're not happy with that, you can deploy it and get a little bit more data just to fine tune. But the bulk of the generalization will come from the prior data. And that's what we, we would like to get from offline reinforcement learning algorithms. If we can do this, then perhaps we will be able to get reinforcement learning algorithms that generalize to broad open world settings the same way that our supervised learning systems do by utilizing very large data sets. Uh, and then maybe we can solve robotics problems, but also problems that we don't typically think of as reinforcement learning problems, like deciding on prescriptions for patients or planning scientific experiments, controlling a power plant, managing inventory, and so on. Things where we can get data, but where it is impractical to run real-time online active interaction for exploration. So the ideal workflow for an offline RL method would look like this. Step one, collect a data set using any policy or mixture of policies. Um, this could come from humans doing the task. It could come from an existing system, an existing hand-engineered system performing the task. 
It could come from random behaviors or any combination of the above. And this is only done once. You've collected the data, so just like ImageNet was only collected once, you only collect your data once, you store it, and then you will use it many times for many experiments. And then you run offline reinforcement learning on this data set to learn a policy. You could think of it as the best policy we can get from the provided data. And then you deploy your policy in the real world. And if you are not happy with how well it does, modify your algorithm and go back to step two, reusing the same data. So you could do this for your inventory management task, your uh, medical treatment task, whatever. So this is the workflow that we would like to enable. And the, what I'm going to discuss in this talk is how can we design algorithms that make this possible? Can I uh, kind of ask a naive question there? Um, yes, please. Uh, in like a DQN, uh, there's a, a replay buffer. And I wonder uh, whether there's any difference between this offline RL and the, the, the replay buffer methodology in DQN. Thank you for asking. Yes, um, I will actually shortly describe what the issue is. So the starting point for the methods I will cover is basically Q learning. Uh, and in fact, when we started this research a few years back, our starting point was to say, well, let's take Q learning methods and see if they can do this. And it turns out that there's a problem with that, which I'll describe shortly. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so that's actually the first, the first thing I will cover. Why is offline RL difficult? Um, then I'll describe how to design such algorithms. I'll talk about a particular algorithm called conservative Q-learning that we've developed uh, about a year back. I'll talk a little bit about model-based offline RL, and then I'll conclude with some discussion of evaluation and best practices there. But yeah, let, let's start with the, um, the question uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, Professor Lee actually posed, which is, well, why is this difficult? Why can't existing Q-learning methods handle this problem? So first, a quick primer on reinforcement learning, just to get us on the same page in terms of notation. Uh, we have an agent, uh, that agent interacts with the world, and the agent selects actions, uh, which we call A. And the world responds with uh, states, S, and a reward, R, S, A. The agent's goal is to select a policy, pi, and the objective is to select the policy that achieves the largest cumulative re expected reward. So maximize the total reward over all time. A very useful object for this is something called the Q function. The Q function for a particular policy pi tells you if you start in state ST and then take action AT and then follow the policy pi, what will be the total reward that you will accumulate? And the Q function is a very useful object because if you have the Q function for a policy pi, you can recover a new policy that is at least as good or better by taking an action with probability one, if it is the arg max. So it's a policy improvement. Uh, and this is the basis for policy iteration, basically. Extract a Q function, get a better policy, extract its Q function, get a better policy, and repeat. That's policy iteration. We can also skip the uh, middleman and directly learn the optimal Q function if we satisfy the Bellman equation. So if we find Q star, such that the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this equation are equal, then we will get the optimal Q function. And that is the basis of Q learning. That is the basis of DQN. And that is the basis of uh, basically any fitted Q based algorithm in use today. So if we can get this equation to be equal at all states, then we've got the optimal Q. And that means we've got the optimal policy. So typically, the way that we use this idea is we take our replay buffer, uh, which consists of uh, uh, tuples SI, AI, SI prime. And then we minimize the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the Bellman equation. So we solve this minimization problem that I have here on this slide. So that's the basis of basically all Q learning style algorithms. Um, and in this talk, I'm gonna focus entirely on approximate dynamic programming, meaning methods uh, that are Q function based. There are other methods too for offline RL, methods based on important sampling, which I will not cover. Uh, so don't be surprised by that, but uh, my focus will be on dynamic programming. Okay, so how can we imagine using this Q learning formalism for off policy RL and also for offline RL? Um, here's how we can think about it. We don't need on policy data to enforce this Bellman equation. Remember, it should be enforced so that it holds at all states and actions. So what we do is we sample some states and actions, enforce it at those and hope that if we have enough samples, then maybe it will hold everywhere. 
through generalization. So an off policy Q learning method might look like this, collect a data set using some policy, add it to your buffer. Then in an inner loop, sample a batch from that buffer, minimize the difference between the left-hand side and right-hand side of the Bellman equation on that batch, and then repeat. And you could go out and collect more data if you like. So graphically, you can think of it like this. You've got the transitions in your buffer. You're going, going to be crunching away on that buffer, improving your Q function. And occasionally, you can go out and get more data. But if you are doing off, offline RL, then you would not collect more data. You would simply delete this step. And everything else, in principle, could stay exactly the same. So this is a valid way to implement an offline RL algorithm. And that's what we started with. Um, a couple of years back, uh, this is about three years back at this point, we actually ran a large scale reinforcement learning experiment. This is work that was done uh, at, uh, at Google actually, where we basically scaled up this basic principle into a real world robotic learning system called QTOPT. QTOPT was a, a large scale paralyzed robotic learning system where you have many robots running at the same time collecting data, as well as stored offline data from all past experiments, a little bit like that picture in the beginning, but specifically for robotic grasping. Um, and the system actually worked decently well. So, uh, you know, when I, when I give presentations to a robotics audience, I often talk about the grasping and robotics element of this work, but today I actually want to emphasize the reinforcement learning lesson from this work. So for the robotics lesson, well, we were very happy. It worked very well. It can pick up all sorts of objects. Uh, so we had a data set of 580,000 transitions, which is pretty large, but we need large data sets for, to grasp any object. But the interesting thing for this talk is that we actually compared purely offline training to offline training followed by online fine tuning. The online fine tuning experiment did not collect very much additional data, only 28,000 additional transitions. So the change in data set size was small, only about 5%. The success rate from only offline training was 87%. With fine tuning, it went up to 96%. Now you might say, well, these numbers are both pretty big. What's the problem? Well, if you look at the failure rate, this 100 minus this, the failure rate is 13% for offline and 4% with fine tuning. So that means that you have three times fewer failures if you fine tune. The amount of additional data you're collecting during online fine tuning is very small. So it's not just the additional data that helps. It's really the fact that you went from offline to online. Another way of saying it is offline, pure offline training is more than three times worse than if you do offline followed by online fine tuning. That's a little bit mysterious. Why is pure offline training so much worse? So uh, about a year after this, we studied this question more systematically in a paper called Stabilizing Off-Policy Q Learning via Bootstrapping Error Reduction led by my student Averal Kumar, where uh, we did a more controlled experiment on a widely studied benchmark task called the half cheetah benchmark. This is a standard benchmark for uh, reinforcement learning. And what we did is we collected medium quality data with a, a trained policy, stored the data in a buffer, and then did offline training on that buffer. Uh, and we found initially we trained with 1000 data points and we found the performance was pretty bad. That's the blue curve. So we thought, well, maybe the problem is overfitting. What if we add more data? Like, you know, if you're training on, on data and you're not doing as well as you hope, maybe add more data and it will help. And adding more data doesn't help here. So the red curve shows 1 million data points and the performance is basically the same, minus 250. Uh, for, for your reference, good performance on half cheetah is about 10,000. So it is not doing well at all. It's doing much worse, in fact, than if we had simply tried to copy the data set, if we, if we had simply run imitation learning. So that's interesting. Uh, next, we try to interrogate the Q function and ask it, how well does it think it's going to do? Remember that the Q function is an estimator for the expected reward the policy will get. So you could ask the policy, what do you think the policy will get? The y-axis here is a log scale. So for the red curve, for example, with 1 million data points, the Q function thinks it'll get 10 to the seventh power reward. And instead it gets minus 250. Well, that's interesting. It thinks it'll do great and it does terribly. That can't be an accident. There must be something going on here. So we, we studied this problem for a long time and we think we figured it out. So to, to describe the problem, I first have to 
I first have to describe uh, a common issue when learning from static data, which is distributional shift. So when we solve supervised learning problems, typically what we're doing is empirical risk minimization, which means that we get samples from a training distribution, we minimize our error on those training samples, and we hope that by doing this, we get a function that does well on other samples from the same distribution. So here our loss is f theta of x minus y squared, our x's are sampled from p of x, and our y's are come from the ground truth function. But then we can ask some questions, and these are very basic questions in machine learning theory. If we train with empirical risk minimization, and then we are given some test point x star, is f theta of x star going to be correct? Right? Seemingly the most basic question we could ask about a learned model. Well, it's actually a very difficult question. Here are some things we know. We know that the, if we didn't overfit, then the expected value of our loss on the training distribution will be low. The expected value of the loss averaged over samples. That does not mean that the expected loss will be low under some other distribution, P bar, that is not the same as P, right? So this only holds if you're looking at the same distribution that you trained on. In fact, even if your test point came from the same distribution P of X, that doesn't mean that the error will be low on that test point. It just means it'll be low on average over test points drawn from the same distribution. Now, those of you in the, in the audience who are deep learning experts, uh, you might be thinking to yourself, well, that doesn't really matter, right? Because we're gonna use neural nets and neural nets will generalize really, really well. So all this learning theory stuff, we don't care about it. We're just gonna have such powerful models that they will just plow through this and generalize anyway. And to be honest, I would usually agree with that. But what if we actually pick X star specifically to maximize the function, right? We don't just pick any old X star. We specifically select X star in an adversarial way so that our learned function outputs the largest value. Then even neural nets will produce big mistakes. Imagine that this green curve is the true function and the blue curve is your fit to that function. Now the blue curve fits the green curve very well in most places, but if you find the max, it'll be precisely that peak that has the largest error in the positive direction. So if you select your X star adversarially, you're in for a bad time. And that's actually exactly what happens when we run QLearn. So here is the Bellman uh, update again. And you'll notice that it has this max. I can rewrite it in a slightly different way. I can write it as uh, the right-hand side as the expected value under another distribution, pi nu, where pi nu is selected to be the argmax distribution. I didn't actually change anything. This is just a different way to write the same thing. And now we can see that the right-hand side of this equation will be correct if the expected value of Q under pi nu is correct. But what is the objective for training Q? Well, the objective is to minimize error under the distribution pi beta, under the distribution, the behavior policy that produced your data set. So that means that you would expect good accuracy when pi beta is equal to pi nu, when you're testing under the same distribution under which you trained. But pi nu is the improved policy. The whole point is that you want pi nu to be better than pi beta. So it's usually not going to be equal. And even worse, pi nu is selected to explicitly maximize the expected value of Q. It is exactly that adversarial thing from the previous slide that is so very bad to use. And that's why we see massive overestimation. That's why when we train on an offline data set, we get terrible results, but the Q function thinks it'll do great because of this distributional shift. So, that's the essence of the challenge we're faced with when we're doing offline RL. And in the next uh, three sections, I'll describe different ways to design offline RL algorithms that all mitigate this problem in some way. Basically, to go from standard off-policy Q-learning methods to offline RL, we basically need to somehow fix this distributional shift problem. So how do prior methods address this issue? Well, one very common class of methods uh, that uh, we refer to as policy constraint methods modify the policy update so that instead of simply maximizing the Q function, 
they instead aim to find a new policy that has the largest expected Q, but also satisfies a constraint that it is not too far away from pi beta. That's why it's called a policy constraint. The idea is that if you don't go too far away from the distribution of the data, then you will not incur too much distributional shift. And then you just repeat. So this in principle solves distributional shift, right? That means we have no more erroneous values. Well, sort of. So these policy constraint methods are a very old idea. They've been studied under many different names, uh, linear MDPs, KL divergence control, trust regions, et cetera. And many recent papers use this basic principle in a variety of different ways. But they have a number of shortcomings. First, enforcing the constraint typically requires knowing what the behavior policy is, which we don't always know. For example, what if we're um, solving an autonomous driving task where data came from human drivers? What if we are solving an inventory management problem where the data came from uh, previous hand-designed inventory management strategies? We might not actually have access to the particular policy that collected all of our data. And second, this might be too conservative. What if our data was collected randomly? That doesn't mean that, we, that our new policy should be random. We want to extract the best policy supported by the data, not necessarily stay close to the data distribution. We want to be inside of it, not necessarily matching it. So these, there are these two issues. Uh, we'll come back to the second issue, but I want to talk about issue one a little bit first. So there's an easy case where the policy constraints are very straightforward. And that's when all of our data comes from the same Markovian policy. Unfortunately, this is not very common nor very realistic. The hard case is when our data comes from many different policies. And that's very common in reality. For example, you might have some demonstration data from humans, some scripted data, some random data. It's also very common in online fine tuning. When you're doing online fine tuning, you might be adding more and more data from different policies. Certainly a replay buffer would look like this. So the data in the replay buffer was not collected by a single Markovian. In fact, it's highly non Markovian. So here's an idea that we can use to enforce constraints without actually knowing what the behavior policy is. It might seem very strange that you can constrain a policy to another policy without knowing what that other policy is, but it turns out that it's possible. So the idea is based on something called advantage-weighted regression. Here's our constraint update. Here's the, the constraint update that we want. And if we use a little bit of Lagrangian duality, what we can do is we can take the, the original constraint problem, write down its Lagrangian, and then actually uh, solve for the solution in terms of the dual variables. And if we do that algebra, I'm not gonna go through the algebra, but I'll, I just have the solution for you. This is the solution expressed in terms of the Lagrange multiplier lambda. So lambda here is a Lagrange multiplier like divergence. It's straightforward to show via duality. And we didn't invent this. This has actually been proposed in a number of previous papers. I believe the first one was actually by Peters et al called reps. Um, a here stands for the advantage function. The advantage is Q minus V and Z is just a normalizer. So this is just an equation. You can derive it with Lagrangian duality. Now this equation still has pi beta in it, right? So Naively, we still haven't actually solved the problem. We still need to know pi beta to figure out the optimal policy. But whenever you have an equation like this, whenever you have some distribution times some other things, you can approximate it using weighted maximum likelihood because maximum likelihood is an expected value, uh, which means it's the sum over all actions of the distribution times the function. So that means that uh, if we take the expected value under pi beta of all the other terms in that equation, basically the one over Z times the exponential advantage, that is a valid estimator for pi star. And then we'll simply train our policy to uh, match those actions with weighted max likelihood. So the weight is basically everything except for pi beta and the expectation is taken under pi beta. So that accounts for the term that multiplies everything by pi beta. So if we can solve this now unconstrained optimization problem at the bottom, if, if we actually uh, solve this perfectly, then we will match pi star. And that means that we'll be enforcing our constraints. And this is very nice now because pi beta still appears in this equation, but it appears in the expectation. So all we need is samples from pi beta. We do not need to know what pi beta actually is. And samples from pi beta 
That's exactly what's contained in our data set. So that's great. We can actually enforce this equation simply by taking samples from our data set, weighting them by the exponentiated advantage and regressing onto them. And that's actually a really interesting and simple algorithm. It looks a lot like imitation learning, except that now our actions are weighted by their advantage. So it's like imitation learning, only you weight your actions by how good your Q function thinks those actions are. It's a very intuitive idea, I think. Uh, and then you would train your Q function the way you, you always do with a Bellman backup. So this is the basis for a number of algorithms uh, cited at the bottom of the slide, advantage-weighted regression and uh, advantage-weighted actor critic. Uh, does it work? Uh, well, we've evaluated this method pretty extensively on both offline training and also offline training with online fine tuning. So the animation you're seeing here, we have some demonstrations that we use for offline training that gives us a 24% success rate. And then when we do some additional online fine tuning using the same exact algorithm, it gets up to 88% success rate. So, uh, you know, on, with offline pre-training and online fine tuning, this method works very well. It's, uh, here it's labeled AWAC, shown in red and generally outperforms previous methods for online fine tuning after offline pre-training. Um, it also works quite well in a range of robotics tasks. So we can actually, you know, because this method effectively utilizes prior data, it's very practical to use for very fast fine tuning with real robots. We can collect a little bit of data from robots and then we can fine tune them and get uh, pretty good results. So here the goal is to rotate the uh, valve 180 degrees. You can see AWAC in the top left corner. Here the goal is to open a drawer. Again, this algorithm can learn to open the drawer very consistently. And here the goal is to use a robotic hand to push this object to the middle of the bin. And you can see that AWAC there in the top left learns the task quite successfully. Okay. Um, in the next section, I'm going to describe a different type of offline RL method that more directly tackles this problem of overestimation. So advantage weighted actor critic and AWR, they're pretty effective methods but they're not the most effective. Uh, the most effective methods actually get rid of the policy constraint altogether. So let me talk about that next. Um, let's, go, let's go back to basics. Let's go back to the issue that we had. The issue that we had was that when we run offline RL, we end up with massive overestimation. And we could address this by constraining the policy, but what if we address it more directly? What if we actually find those erroneously overestimated Q values and somehow fix them? And then we don't need any policy constraint anymore. So what if we can find these peaks, identify them, and actually push them down, okay? Find them and push them down. We're going to formulate a modified Q-learning objective where we have our usual Bellman error term, that's the second line. And then we have an additional regularizer on the first line. And let me explain what this does. So you'll notice that it's minimizing with respect to Q, the Q values for actions sampled from this distribution mu. And mu is chosen to maximize Q values. So mu finds actions whose Q values are big, and this term will then minimize the Q values for those actions. It's a very direct approach. Literally, find big Q values, push them down. Now, this might at first seem like a heuristic, but it turns out that if we implement this method and select the multiplier on this regularizer, select alpha carefully, we can actually prove that the Q function we will learn is less than or equal to the true Q function for the policy pi for a large enough alpha. And that's very good. That means that we are guaranteed not to overestimate if we select alpha carefully. Now, of course, in reality, we don't know a priori what alpha is, so we have to select it heuristically. So in practice, this bound might not hold, but it's good to know that if you select it carefully, you will have uh, a bound, which means you are guaranteed not to overestimate for some choice of alpha. Um, so we can actually derive a slightly better bound, and that's the algorithm that we actually use in practice. The better bound modifies this uh, objective, which always pushes Q values down, with an additional term that pushes them up. So this, this new term will push up on Q values from the data set. That might at first seem very strange. We want to fix overestimation, but now we're gonna push up. That doesn't seem right. But we have two terms. We have one that pushes down and one that pushes up. We push up on data set actions. We push down on adversarially selected actions. And think about what this will do. If the high Q values are for actions that are in distribution, 
then the first term will push them down and the second term will push them up and the two will balance out. So the effect will be minimal. But if the high Q values are for actions outside of the data distribution, they will be pushed down, in distribution actions will be pushed up and we will move back towards the data distribution, which is exactly what we want. Uh, now, if we have this additional term, it turns out that we are no longer guaranteed to have a bound for every state action, but we are guaranteed to have a bound for every state in expectation over the actions. Ultimately, we're concerned with not overestimating the value of our policy, and we still have that guarantee. Again, for a suitable choice of alpha. Um, all right, there are a couple questions in the chat. Um, okay, so one question is, that looks very similar, training of energy-based models. That is a very good observation. You're completely right. We, we've noticed this uh, as well, the implication of that is. So in fact, when you implement this, if you implement this for discrete actions, the implementation can actually be done with a standard cross entropy loss. So it, it really is like the gradient of this is literally the EBM gradient. That's really cool, but I don't know what it means. <laughs> if you have any ideas about what it means, come talk to me. Uh, I think it's cool too, but I don't, I don't know what, what, what to do with that observation. Um, is conservative Q learning also effective in online RL settings? Does the overestimation problem occur in online RL as well? Okay, very good question. Um, I will first let me tell you what my hunch is, and then I will tell you the empirical observation. So my hunch is that it should help in online settings if you take a very large number of gradient steps. So usually you take one simulation step and then one gradient step. But what if you take one simulation step and 1,000 gradient steps? I would think it would help in that case. But when we tried it, we found that it didn't help. We found that it was actually quite bad. And we think that the reason for that is that conservative Q learning will counteract exploration. If you're doing online training, then a little bit of overestimation is actually good because a little bit of overestimation pushes you to explore. And exploration is very important in online training. So we think that conservative Q learning suffers in online training mostly because it destroys exploration which is of course not a problem if you're doing offline RL because if you're doing offline RL, then you don't, you don't want to explore, you just want to succeed. Um, Jeffrey asks, uh, does data set only contain good actions? Uh, good question. Um, in contrast to imitation learning, offline reinforcement learning actually tends to work best when the data set is heterogeneous. Because if you only have good actions, then it's difficult to understand the difference between good and bad. But if you have some actions that are good and some that are bad, a Q learning method should be able to figure out the difference between good and bad and can actually do better. So ideally for offline RL, you would actually have heterogeneous data, which is very different from what, from what you want for imitation learning. Um, okay, uh, so I, I made a big deal out of this bound, but what about empirical results? Like does the bound actually hold in practice? So we did a little experiment where we measured the difference between the estimated Q value, so we, we literally just like average, you know, took the estimated Q value of the initial state uh, and subtracted from it the actual Q value, which is obtained by actually rolling out the policy and measuring its reward. Of course, during offline training, you can't roll out the policy, but if you just want to test it afterwards, then you can. So we measured the difference between the estimated Q value and the true one, and we expect that if we are overestimating, then this difference should be positive. If we are underestimating, it should be negative. Um, so here are the results. Going from right to left, the rightmost column is bare, which is a prior offline RL algorithm. Then we have different ensembling methods. Uh, and then we have CQL. So CQL equation one, that's the first version that has just the minimization. And CQLH has both terms. That's the advanced version. First, you can see that all the prior methods on the right massively overestimate. So they have errors that are very positive and large. CQL equation one underestimates, but makes big errors. So it's negative, but they're pretty big negative numbers. The full CQL method in the leftmost column also underestimates, but the errors are much smaller. Uh, so CQL always has negative errors. That's what we want to see. And prior methods tend to be overly optimistic. Um, how does CQL compare to other approaches? Well, I'll show you some results, but I will say these are old results. These are from over a year ago. Many other methods have come out 
many of them actually build on CQL that are better. Uh, and, I, and I'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide. But at the time that, that CQL was developed, uh, it actually, the state of offline RL was not very good. So these are some of the more complex tasks in the D4RL benchmark suite, Ant, Maze, Adroit, and Kitchen. Uh, and on these tasks, the leftmost column BC, that's just behavior cloning. So you can see that basically nothing works on the harder Ant mazes back then. Uh, that's not the case anymore, but back then. Uh, and just cloning the data was actually very competitive on Adroit and Kitchen. That's actually still the case. Um, CQL at the time did very well across uh, the range of these, especially on the ant maze tasks where previous methods didn't really work. Uh, it also did very well on Atari games. And, but again, since then, many other methods have come out, many of them building on CQL that do better than this. Um, I will say a few words about uh, the growth in offline RL since uh, the CQL paper came out. So over the last 15 months, there's actually been enormous growth of interest in offline RL and a number of papers that have developed new techniques uh, but CQL is quite widely used. Here are some excerpts from uh, evaluations in other more recent papers. This is a paper uh, that studies methodological problems in offline RL evaluation. One of their findings is they make evaluation more complex. CQL uh, outperforms, uh, you know, including more recent approaches. And they have this nice quote. Surprisingly, the experimental results demonstrate that these compared offline RL algorithms fail to outperform either the simplest behavior cloning method nor the deterministic behavior policy only accepts CQL. Uh, more recently also, this is a paper from uh, University of Toronto that showed that uh, incorporating data augmentation into various offline RL methods helps and especially for CQL, it results in very good uh, performance. So, uh, you know, CQL from 2020 is not the best method by any means, but there's a lot of uh, research that could be done building on that and developing more advanced techniques. All right, the last algorithmic topic I'm going to discuss is model-based offline RL. So, so far I talked about algorithms based on the principles of Q-learning, which are all model-free algorithms, but we can also do model-based offline RL. So what's the principle behind model-based RL? Many of you might already know this. Uh, instead of training a Q function or a policy through interaction with the real world, you use data to train a model, something that predicts future states given current states and actions. Uh, and a very popular class of model-based RL methods are kind of Dynast style algorithms, where you take rollouts from the real world shown in black, you pick states along those rollouts and you make short rollouts from those states using your model. Uh, so the model kind of answers what if questions. What if I were to go back to one of the states I've seen and what if I were to take a different action in that state, would that be better or worse? So it's pretty easy to imagine doing model-based RL without additional data collection, doing offline model. So what goes wrong in this case? Well, the problem is actually very similar to the overestimation problem in Q-learning. Much like Q-learning, we could discover out of distribution erroneously good actions with model-based offline RL, we discover out of distribution erroneously good states. So if your model can be fooled into states that, can't, that erroneously thinks are good, meaning that you can pick some action that'll fool model into thinking, oh, that action will take me to this really, even though that's not possible in reality. Um, there's a question in the chat. Um, for offline RL algorithms with online fine tuning, uh, how do they compare to pure online RL? Uh, and is there a, a theoretical or uh, empirical performance limit? Um, that's a very good question. It depends a lot on what the offline data is. So for the, the tasks that I covered in the, in the third portion of the talk, uh, where we use demonstrations as the offline data, there the offline data helps enormously. So there, if you just do pure online RL, those tasks are basically unsolvable. But that's because the offline data solves the exploration problem for you. Of course, if you have very bad offline data, maybe it doesn't help. So it depends on the data. In terms of the theoretical um, results, hold on a second, because I'm going to actually discuss that in the context of this model-based method. So I'll talk about that actually a few slides from now. OK, so the problem with offline model-based RL is that we get these out-of-distribution states now. And uh, those out-of-distribution states will make us be erroneously optimistic. Um, so here is a, an idea. This is uh, from a paper called MOPO uh, by uh, Tianhe Yu. Uh, so this is in collaboration with some folks from Stanford, uh, Chelsea Finn and Tengyu Ma. Um, 
So the solution in this paper is a little bit similar to conservative Q-learning in spirit, which is to punish the policy for exploiting. Uh, and it turns out that in a model-based RL, there's actually a very simple way to punish the policy. Take the reward function and subtract a penalty called U here. And this penalty will penalize doing things that cause the model to make mistakes, right? Because you want to prevent exploitation. Exploitation happens when the model makes mistakes. So you will assign a penalty when the policy does something that causes the model to make mistakes. Very simple idea. So U here is an uncertainty penalty. U needs to be an estimator of model error. Now, of course, you don't know exactly what the model error is. So all that we require is that U should be no smaller than the model error. So U should be greater than or equal to the model error. And then we just use any existing model-based RL algorithm. So the idea is that now, when the policy exploits the model and goes to one of these out of distribution states, it basically, it is not rewarded for that because it gets a really big penalty. As long as you have a faithful error estimator, you'll get a big penalty. And it, you can show that for a large enough Lambda, that penalty can always overpower any ill-gotten gains that you get by exploiting the model. And then the policy will be forced data and avoid those out of distribution places. So the only change is to modify your reward function with this uncertainty penalty. Uh, and here's the theoretical analysis for this. And this is the part that uh, I think is actually quite interesting. Um, so this is the main theorem in the paper. I will walk you through this carefully because obviously there's some notation here. So there are two assumptions. The first assumption is that you can represent the value function. That's a very reasonable assumption, right? So if you, if you can't represent the value function, if you don't have a, a big enough neural net, this doesn't hold. The second assumption is that U is a, a, a valid estimator for your error. And formally, what that means is that the error is bounded above by U. U is greater than or equal to the model error. You can use a variety of metrics for error. The one that's uh, simplest is total variation divergence. But there's other choices that you could use as well. So those are the assumptions. A to M is the true return of the policy trained under the model. So this is the real thing. This is how good your learned policy pi hat is. Epsilon is the expected value of your error, right? So that, that's, that's how much total model error you're incurring. So what this is saying is if you learn your policy with a penalty multiplier lambda, its true performance will be no worse than the best possible policy that is penalized by that error. Okay. This might seem a little cryptic, but this has a few interesting implications. So first, you can imagine the class of all policies whose total error is bounded by lambda. And then it follows that your learned policy will be at least as good uh, as the best policy whose error is bounded by lambda minus, uh, sorry, by delta minus two, ti two times lambda delta. Okay, so penalized by that error. This has some implications, some interesting corollaries. First, this implies that you will improve over the behavior policy because the behavior policy, that's the policy that collected the data that was used to train your model. So your error under the behavior policy should be very low. So if your error under the behavior policy is very low, that means that second term two, two times lambda times epsilon is basically close to zero. So you are very, very likely to be better than the behavior policy if you learned a good model. Second, if your data covers the regions where the optimal policy will go, meaning that you, your model is accurate on the states and actions that the optimal policy will select, then you will be close to the optimal policy. So this kind of quantifies the optimality gap in terms of your data. It's basically saying if your data covers the kind of stuff that the optimal policy will do, then you will be as good as the optimal policy. Now, of course, if your data is terrible, uh, then the implication of this guarantee is not particularly useful. So you do have to have decent data. Uh, more recently, uh, okay, there's a few questions. Um, I was understanding that we have to train both the world model and a policy in model-based learning. Uh, is the penalty for the policy or the world model? Um, the penalty is for the policy. So the model is actually not changed at all in this case. The model is, is just trained with supervised learning, but the policy is penalized for going to places where the model makes errors. So we don't get rid of model errors, we just punish the policy for exploiting them. Um, okay, more recently, we developed a, a new model-based uh, offline RL method that works a bit better called COMBO. COMBO stands for conservative model-based RL. And this is a much more direct way to apply the CQL idea to 
offline model based RL. So the idea is instead of changing the reward function, we'll actually directly penalize uh, the Q function. So this is the, the combo objective. And it looks very similar to CQL. The difference is the minimization term, that first term, has a different distribution. Instead of minimizing adversarially chosen actions, we actually minimize Q values for all states and actions that come from the model. And then we maximize the Q values under the data. So the intuition is, if the model produces something that looks clearly different from real data, then the Q function will make it look bad. But if the model is producing things that look very similar to real data, the Q function can't tell the difference and it won't make it look bad. It's a little similar to how a GAN works, right? So as long as your model is producing things that are indistinguishable from real data, then the Q function cannot make that look worse than real data. And then the, the penalty does very little. But if the model produces something very unrealistic, the model says, oh, I, I can tell the difference. And then the Q function will make that look really bad. Uh, and that actually works quite well. So this, this is the evaluation. The, um, the second column combo, that's this method, the one next to it is MOPO. So you can see the combo is, uh, achieves the state-of-the-art results on almost all of these tasks. All right, um, so that's it for the technical portion. Uh, at the very end, I want to discuss a little bit, I like to think about. So, algorithms, how should we evaluate them, right? You know, once we have really good offline RL methods, then, you know, sort of the world is your oyster. Then you just use it, get all your good results. But as you're developing these methods, what considerations should you keep in mind? Well, you need to construct some data set to use to evaluate your method as you develop it. So a very common thing that people think about is, well, what if I just train a reference policy with reinforcement learning, store it, and then use it as offline data? It's a very logical idea. And the typical protocol in prior work is to train a policy with online RL, collect uh, either through our training or just use the final policy and then use it for offline RL just to test your algorithm. And I would say that this is a very bad idea. It's a bad idea for a few reasons. First, if you already have a good policy, why bother doing offline RL? Like it seems like that's not a very realistic setting. And in the real world, the data often comes from sources that are much more difficult than other RL policies. It might come from a non-Markovian policy. It might come from humans, from hand-engineered policies. You have to use data that's representative of real-world settings and leaves lots of room for improvement. This is very important if you want to evaluate your algorithm faithfully. And offline RL really has to learn policies that are much better than the behavior policy. So if you have near-optimal data, you can't do better than that. So what's the point of writing offline RL on? So you have to leave lots of room for improvement. Otherwise, you're not really testing your method. Um, so without testing these properties, we can't trust that our algorithms are good. Um, so uh, a benchmark that we developed called D4RL uh, does have a few tasks to test this. So it has the standard uh, Mujoko Jim tasks, but I think those are not very interesting. What is more interesting is data from humans, like the dexterous manipulation task, because there you can do better than the human data. Tasks that have some element of stitching, where there is no good trajectory in the data at all. Maybe you want to go from A to C, but you have some data going from A to B and B to C. Can you combine it to figure out how to go from A to C? Can you, can you combine the data to do a new thing that was not actually seen in the data set? That's very, very important. And we have some navigation tasks that test that in the D4RL data set. So I think these kinds of stitching properties are really important to study. Uh, and unfortunately, since we've released the D4RL data set, lots of people use it, but many people actually skip over the harder tasks like the stitching tasks. I think it's very important to use those tasks. Um, and then more realistic tasks, things like autonomous driving, robotic manipulation, you know, that's also nice to have to make sure that the methods are scalable. So if you're going to be developing offline RL methods, I would strongly encourage you to test on the harder tasks to make sure that your method can actually do better than the best trajectory in the data set, to make sure that it's really doing reinforcement learning and not just imitation. Okay, I think I'm uh, a little short on time, so I'll skip over this part uh, and I'll just uh, conclude with a few concluding notes. So um, what is missing? Uh, from current offline RL algorithms, right? So I outlined this kind of dream where you collect a data set using any policy, run offline RL and get great results. And then we have current offline RL algorithms. What's the gap? What is missing? Uh, first, I think one thing that's missing is a good offline RL workflow. So this is not an algorithm question. This is a workflow question. In supervised learning, we have a really good workflow. We have a training validation test split. You use your validation set, adjust your hyperparameters, and then you will do well in the test set. There's unfortunately no such thing in offline RL. And oftentimes when we adjust hyperparameters, we actually have to run on online rollouts and that's a really bad thing. That's not realistic at all. 
So we need to develop better workflows. And it's not just a, a matter of protocols or benchmarks, it's actually a scientific question. Like what is a principled, statistically sound workflow uh, that we can use? Nobody knows yet. So that's a good thing to work on. Statistical guarantees. Uh, this is a big challenge in offline RL because we're dealing with distributional shift and counterfactual questions. So in supervised learning, we often don't tackle this, but in offline RL, it's critical. And can we make any guarantees, for example, about pessimisms, overestimation, underestimation? These are very important questions. And then we need scalable methods and large scale applications. We need to study realistic offline RL problems. Um, you know, things like dialogue systems or data-driven navigation and driving. These are big problems to tackle. All right, thank you very much for listening. I'd like to especially thank my students uh, who were involved uh, in, in carrying out this work. And I'd like to thank all of you, of course, for listening. Um, it looks like there are a few questions in the chat. So uh, I'll go through those uh, next. Um, okay, so the techniques used in MOPO seem applicable in online settings as well. Is it effective or it interrupts exploration? Um, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer to that um, yet. So far, it kind of seems like it doesn't make that much of a difference, but to be honest, we haven't tried very hard. So the naive version where you don't have the penalty called MBPO, it actually works very well in online uh, RL and it's just, it seems like there's kind of no room for improvement. But of course, that's a function of the problems you're testing it on. So on those kinds of benchmark problems, basically uh, MBPO, which doesn't have the conservative penalty is just as good in the online setting, but maybe on harder problems, there'll be more of a gap. Um, <laughs> the word stitching is quite cool. Thank you. Uh, I do think it's, it's quite cool. I think it's also a, a really cool thing to explore. I wonder that offline learning works in long horizon and sparse reward systems. Which reward system did you apply in the massive real world physical robot uh, that you introduced in the beginning of the talk? Uh, good question. So for the grasping setting, the reward is actually sparse. The reward is one if the grasp is successful at the very end. And every other time step gets a constant reward of negative 0 0.005. Why 0 0.005? Uh, we don't know. That's just what worked. But it, it's sparse, meaning that the signal is only at the very end. Um, it actually seems like offline RL works quite well when you have sparse signals. Uh, it's because it doesn't have to deal with exploration. Usually the big challenge with sparse signals is that exploration is hard. But when you're doing offline RL, there is no exploration. So it's actually uh, a pretty good way to uh, set up your rewards. If the collected data is uh, filled with the experiences without success, do you think the offline RL agent can learn the long horizon and sparse reward system? In this manner, how can we deal with the states which have not been visited? Good question. So of course, if you've never seen successful outcomes, then there is nothing you can do. You cannot succeed uh, at the task you, if you don't know what success even means. However, uh, I, I think an interesting question is how little success can you get away with? And I don't know the answer to that, um, but it may be that uh, you can actually get away with a small number of successes because most of your states and actions are not labeled with the, with the reward, they're labeled with the target value and the target value includes the next Q function. So there's, there's actually a lot of information contained in those Q values. So it may be that a small number of successes is enough, but I don't know, that's speculation. So I think it's, a, it's an important thing to study, but if you have no successes, then there's no hope. Any other questions? Okay. Any other questions? I actually. Think, uh, oh, yeah, oh sorry. Ahead. There's uh, another one in the chat that I was reading. Um, do you think offline RL algorithms generally work well for real-world applications like robot manipulation? What is the main challenge for real-world applications? Um, that's a very good question. We've used offline RL for real-world robotic manipulation tasks, and it can be made to work very well. If I had to name one challenge as the biggest challenge, I would actually say this first one, the workflow. Basically, the problem, the, the big struggle we always have when we try to use it in the real world is that we train up a policy and then we don't know if that policy will be good or not. And it's pretty costly to test it. And it's especially costly if you want to tune hyperparameters. So figure out how to tune hyperparameters. I think that's really important. And if any of you guys have ideas about that, you know, you write a paper about it, I think that'll be really influential. Uh, when using offline RL, we can configure and extract the data set at will. Is there a way to sample the data for better learning? That's a good question. I don't know. I imagine there's some sort of prioritization or some sort of hard negative mining you could do, but I haven't seen anybody do that. 
So yeah, I think if you want to explore that, I, I imagine that could be a pretty interesting research topic. Yes, there's a KL divergence question. Oh, I I don't see it. Is it maybe it was sent by private chat? Um, let me repeat the question. Uh, the question is, why do you still want to keep minimizing the KL divergence between pi beta rather than updated pi? That is the question. Oh, okay. Um, so the policy constraint is a constraint between your new policy and the policy that collected the data set. So perhaps what you're referring to is that trust region methods will typically minimize the KL divergence between the new policy and the previous policy. But in offline RL, we actually want to stay close to the behavior policy because that's where our data came from, right? In, in trust region methods, your data came from the previous policy, but here there's no more deployment. So it always comes from behavior policy. So that's what you want to constrain to. Mm -hmm. Which ratio of non-expert to expert data is best? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So, so I guess what we're getting at is like, what should the composition of the data set be? Um, I don't know. And I think that's actually, that's, a, that's another really good question to study in offline RL, but we have very little guidance about what makes for a good offline RL data set. Like there's some intuition. It seems like very diverse data sets that have lots of coverage are good. And it's important for the data set to cover good data, but also, but also cover bad data so that you know what, what the bad stuff is. But, but there isn't that much kind of formalism around what's really ideal. So I, I think that's also another good, good question to study if you want to do some research on this. Actually, related to that, I was wondering uh, whether this offline RL can be uh, applied to imitation learning. It's kind of related to one of the questions. Yeah. Uh, that's actually something we're studying right now. So um, we're trying to basically figure out if you do have near expert data, is there any benefit to doing offline RL or should you just always do imitation? And it's actually not obvious. So, so there's a little bit of theory that you can do about that to study how error accumulates in RL methods versus in imitation learning methods. Um, and the answer is not obvious. You know, there's bounds on both sides, but it's a matter of who can work out the tighter bound. Uh, and we're working on that right now, but I think it's a, that's actually an open question. It's not as obvious as it might seem. Okay. And also in terms of like the, the, the data size, the, the, for the data that you use in the offline training, how big does that uh, have to be? Uh, I mm -hmm. can, I, for example, for very complex problems like uh, Go, uh, you, sometimes uh, the, the amount of data you collect may not be enough to cover the the entire, you know, coverage? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, again, I don't have a great answer. I think it's an important question to study, but the answer, as far as I know, is not known. What I can say anecdotally is we found that generally you need, you know, somewhat more data than you would need for imitation learning, but not like, not enormously more. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like, it seems like the bottleneck is basically not the fact that you're doing RL, but the fact that, you know, if you want generalization, you need large data sets. So you need, you need a bit more than if you were doing supervised learning, but not enormously more, at, at least anecdotal. Actually, we have a fairly large audience. Uh, we, we are simulcasting through uh, YouTube. There are about 30 people there. If there are any questions from YouTube domain, please relay that message. Actually, one of our TAs are relaying those questions. Are there any questions from YouTube? Not yet. <laughs> uh, any other questions uh, before uh, we uh, finish up? Um, actually, this is uh, getting near uh, lunchtime here. So <laughs> everybody is getting hungry. Uh, any questions? Okay, so uh, so if there's no more questions, oh, there's one, one more. Um, I think that you collect data with various agents and if there exists SA pairs that share S but with different actions, how can we expect the agent to learn using uh, AWAC? Ah, okay, so in advantage-weighted actor critic, 
the actions are weighted by the advantage. So if you have multiple actions in, the, in similar states, that's actually very good because then you can figure out which actions are better than others. So remember that it's weighted max likelihood. So presumably one of those actions will have a better advantage than the other and it will get a higher weight. So it'll basically pick the better of the two. Oh, actually, at the beginning, um, you mentioned that uh, that you you mentioned about that uh, overestimation issue. Um, does that um, kind of uh, mean that it it only occurs when you use only for like only like two learning based algorithm? And what if you use like different type of algorithm like a SARS or Right. Anything like that, then do you still have this overestimation issue? So th the overestimation happens for any dynamic programming method because any dynamic programming method, approximate dynamic programming method, will have a target value update. It mm -hmm. does not happen if you use important sampled policy gradients without a value function. That has a different problem, which is that with importance weights, the uh, variance of your estimator becomes very large. So you can kind of think of it as a bias variance trade-off. You use importance weights, you have low bias, very little overestimation, but enormous variance. If you use dynamic programming, you have very uh, low variance, but potentially enormous bias because of overestimation. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. One more. Uh, two more. <laughs> okay. Um, how, how do you think reinforcement learning services using robots uh, are before commercialization? Okay. Um, yeah, that's a that's a tough one to predict. If I could predict that accurately, I would be a very wealthy person, I think. But uh, unfortunately, I don't have that particular superpower. Um, I do think that, though, in terms of where the technology is, uh, that, that we're actually very close to the point where basic manipulation skills for industrial applications like manufacturing and bin picking are within reach. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm collaborating with a number of industrial partners actually working on this, and I, and I think it's actually very, very close. Uh, you know, probably we're going to start seeing, uh, if, if they're not out there already, we're going to see in industrial applications, you know, with, in, in a matter of like, you know, a year or two. In terms of service robots, kind of robots in the home and so on, that I don't know, because there's so many other questions there besides just how proficient your skills are. Um, do you think it's always better to learn models and use the learn model? even when using model-free algorithms? Um, not necessarily. I think it's actually very task dependent as to whether it is easier to learn a model or to learn a value function. Basically, it depends on whether it's easier to predict the laws of physics in your universe or whether it's easier to uh, figure out good actions. So if you have very high dimensional state, if you have images, maybe model-based RL is hard. Uh, on the other hand, if you have lower dimensional tasks, maybe it's easier. So I think it's very, very task dependent. Um, Approximate DP means that you apply the greedy action selection. Um, when I say approximate dynamic programming, I just mean that you estimate some sort of value function or Q function and you back it up. So basically, a, approximate dynamic programming is when your learned value function or Q function serves as a target for itself in future iterations. Uh, so that's the basis of dynamic programming. Um, it is unusual that there's no exploration. And I think that offline RL is ultimately about finding the optimal trajectory, which is cl close to the given data. Am I uh, understanding this correctly? There is an important difference. And that important di difference is the, um, the stitching. So this is actually kind of the, the bit that I skipped over, uh, but I mentioned this before. So imagine that you have a trajectory that goes from A to B and another trajectory that goes from B to C. Both of those might be highly suboptimal. But you can combine them and figure out something that goes from A to C. You can figure out something that was never seen in the data by combining parts that you have seen. So you can, in principle, do much better than the best trajectory in the data set. And that's kind of macro level stitching. You could also imagine sort of micro level stitching. Let's say that you've seen lots of suboptimal trajectories that each have small near optimal parts. If you combine the most optimal parts, maybe there's millions of them, but if you put together just the right parts, you can do much better than any one trajectory that you've seen. Um, I wonder if there are works on the interpretability of the learned policy. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a very interesting topic. It's not something that I work on. Uh, I think there is probably work on it, but I'm not very familiar with that, unfortunately. Um, there's also a private message that, 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 that I just got. Is, is RL currently being applied to a real autonomous vehicle in the field? 
I cannot answer that question, sorry. Um, you should ask Andre Karpathy at Tesla. I, 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 bet, I bet that he knows the answer to this. <laughs> okay, so uh, I guess uh, we are running a little late, but uh, I really um, uh, appreciate your uh, spending like precious evening time with us. It's almost your personal time. And uh, I really thank you again, uh, Professor uh, Levin. And uh, uh, let us uh, thank the speaker uh, once again with a big round of applause, although you may not, it may not be audible. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you okay. for inviting me. And thank, okay. thank you all um, of you for listening and your wonderful questions. Uh, it was a lot of fun.